I've got a beautiful word for you tonight. Every word of God is power packed. Amplified says no word of God is void of power. The book of Romans. We're going to get into a teaching called divine authority. My wife has been speaking a lot in the mornings on authority. I find there's a real lack of understanding on divine authority or God's authority in the earth. And our desire is to eliminate that problem <laughs> by bringing some truth. Holy Ghost, I thank you for right now taking the word of God and showing it unto us. For Jesus said of you that you would take the words of truth and reveal them unto us. Take the things that are mine and show them unto you. I depend on you to do your part. And I thank you that you're faithful, obedient to glorify Jesus in our midst by the illumination and the revelation and the enlightenment of the word of God. Teach us divine authority tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 13, starting with verse 1. I want to read 1 through 7. Let every soul, by the way, is the word suke. That's the one that has to be the soul. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Divine authority deals with that there is no authority but God. You don't have inherent authority. You have delegated authority. Behold, I give unto you authority, Luke 10, 19 says. And Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power. The word is exousia. Exousia is delegated authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power, dunamis, force, might, strength, and ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's comforting to know that in a time when you are being challenged or threatened, isn't it? To know that, behold, I give unto you the authority over the power of the enemy. It's nice to know that the church has that the gates of hell can't prevail against the church with that type of authority. And in this word here, we find the word powers, power, and powers. Power in verse 2 and power in verse 3. In verse 1, you find the word powers, power, and powers. Verse 2, the word power. In verse 3, the word power. Every time that word is exousia. And now that means delegated authority. Let every sub, uh, soul be subject unto the higher authorities. For there is no authority but of God. Jesus said in Matthew, All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. The word power, exousia. Again, he's saying all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. How much authority has been given unto Jesus? All of it. The only amount you've got is how much he delegates. And he's given us authority. But we must make a distinction that we are not people with authority in the earth independent of God. There is no authority outside of God for there is no authority but God. Therefore, your authority is only powerful and effective to the same degree that you are walking in agreement with God. Again, your resistance is according to your submission. Your resistance to the devil, to evil, to sickness, disease, oppression, fear, terror, worry, anxiety, frustration, depression. Your resistance to that is only as effective as you are in submission to the God and his word. Which gives you your authority. Now, I want you to turn to some scriptures. In Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. And I want to show you. One of the telltale signs of the end times. One of them. 
Second Peter chapter two. Verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lusts, lust of uncleanness and despise government. Notice that statement. Despise government. Presumptuous. Look at this type of people that despise authority, government, rulers, God's ministers. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil against the dignities or the authorities of God. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Look at for a moment in the book of Jude, speaking about the angels' operation. Verse 9 of 1st Jude says, yet Michael, the archangel, chief arche, <laughs> I like that, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. But they speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Now he said in speaking evil of authorities or dignities, speaking evil against God's authorities, the angels of God won't even do that. In fact, the archangel, the chief prince of the angel of God, Michael wouldn't even speak evil against Satan. Because at one time, Satan was God's authority. You heard this morning how that David would not speak against Saul. Did you not? Sure you did. You saw where David would not bring an accusation against, the, against Saul, even though God had renounced Saul. As long as Saul was in that position that God gave him, David wouldn't touch him, would not speak against the authority of God. One of the telltale signs of our day and age is that we are not afraid to speak against governments. We're not afraid to speak against the authorities of God. How many people say, you know, I just don't like this preacher. And the next thing you know about for the next 10 minutes is going to come evil speaking against the authority of God. I didn't say that he was right on. But we don't have a fear of governments. We have no respect for God's government. for government that's one of the telltale signs and we've been talking all this week on God's government God's authority in the church how God establishes it how he sets it up how he operates and yet we do not want to neglect the fact that we cannot afford to despise it now I want to give you the word spies kata phroneo kata is the Greek word meaning down or under phroneo is the word now listen to where this word phroneo is used here it's used, despise, and using the word to despise. But that word is used, if you remember, it says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The word mind is phroneo in the Greek. Now there's another time that Jesus met the apostle or the disciple Peter at the time, and Peter said something contrary 
to the law and the nature of God in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus turned and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Now the word savorest is the word phroneo. Now let's put this together for a moment. He said, you do not savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Let this phroneo, this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And now he says, do not phroneo government. Now he's simply saying this. The word phroneo means a thought process that leads to an end somewhere. It's to think or to exercise the mind toward. Now notice this when he's speaking to Peter. Get thou behind me, Satan. For you are not capable of a thought process that glorifies or goes to God. It always goes the way of man, which is an offense to me. So he says, now let this thought process be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Think like Christ thinks. Now he's saying here, do not despise government. Now remember, kata, down thinking. Now what is he saying? Do not allow your thoughts to think down or little of government. And I want you to know something. In, in the 60s, we had a demonic breakout in America caused despising authorities in every area. Who do you think was behind that? Satan himself. They hated the teachers. They hated their mothers. They hated their dads. They did everything they could to rebel and disobey. And they had, if you don't believe it's demonic, watch the spirit behind it. Every demon spirit behind anything brings a law of sameness. There's a conformity. And their major echo was, I'm not going to be like the establishment. I'm going to be different. And every one of them looked the same. Acted the same. Spoke the same. Reacted the same. And a lot of times smelled the same. I was involved in that. Do you know what started that? Demons. Do you know why it started? Because of hypocrite parents that the kids couldn't take it anymore in their hypocrisy and they rebelled against the authority that was hypocritical. But the problem was it was so demonic that they were not able to make a distinction of hypocritical authority and divine authority. So they rebelled against all authority. Yes, it is right. Hallelujah. And it wasn't just the 60s kids' fault. It was the parents because, as one man of God said, he went up to Washington. They invited him up to discuss the means of con his success. I want to know about your success in handling the drug pollution problem. He said we have less, the government says, we have less than 4% of all the millions of dollars we pour into government, I mean into drug control, less than 4% of it is working for the youth. We understand you have 80% working. We want to know what you've got. So he starts speaking to them about the power of the Holy Ghost in the, in the youth life and how that Jesus makes the difference. But when he did, he said he started watching waitresses or their White House people come in and serving martinis and serving drinks. And they always lighten up their little things, smoking their little cigars and cigarettes and smoking and, and drinking, etc. And he said before the meeting was halfway over with, half of them was sauced. And they were asking me to tell them how to control their kids. And he said, the anger of God hit me. And I rose up, he says, you hypocritical leaders, no wonder the youth have turned from you. You judge them for the powder pill while you drink the liquid one. The only difference, he said, is in the bag they carry. Theirs is brown, yours is white. And he was upset about it. I saw his points. That's what caused the great rebellion of the 60s with the youth. They saw hypocritical things. They saw deacons and leaders of the church that were just as bad as the next guy. Because I mean, when I was in high school, I used to go. I wasn't ever involved in any church. I was raised a sinner. But when I remember what they did, I used to go down where the old bootlegger, literally, he had, he had an old peg leg. We used to go down his station every Sunday and we'd get down there and he'd given out free booze to all the kids and we'd all get out there and we'd drink with them and stuff and have a ball. And all the deacons of the churches would come down there and kind of have a way of coming in the back door and leaving. And as a kid I watched it. It burns you inside, see. 
It hurts. It's, oh, God, there's no truth. And you come up and do what the, the man said to Jesus. What is truth? Well, there's one that was holy. Hallelujah. Well, I said all that to let you know. That's the reason they despise or think very little of authority or government. They despise it. Their, their thought processes is on a negative down. See, to think down towards something. It's on, a, it's on a negative down. When you mention the word authority, there is a, oh, who cares about authority? Be your own man. Do your own thing. Do whatever, whatever you want to do. That's not the way of God. So you see what is Jesus doing? Well, before, because of every negative move of the devil, there's a positive move of God to restore truth back in that area. And God is right now restoring back to the body of Christ truth in the area of divine authority so that we will no longer be brute beasts that are so quick to speak evil of the dignities or the authorities and the rulers of God. You have a problem when a cop pulls you over when it's justified and you can't take it and you criticize. And I know a lot of them when the cop will pull them over the moment the cops leaves. I mean, you've got a, about a 15-minute verbal discourse that would choke any mule. And you were the one that literally did it. You have a problem with authority. See, you're rebellious. You're disobedient. And you're classified close to the area of a brute beast. <laughs> you brute beast. Well... We don't want to do that. We want to learn some things about divine authority so we quit acting like animals, beasts, and start acting like humans. Amen? <laughs> because it's the animals that have no understanding of authority until you beat it into them. <laughs> Love can show them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It sure can. All right. Let me show you another scripture in the book of Jude. You were over close to it a while ago. You were in it. <laughs> Let's go to verse 8 of St. Jude for a moment. And then I want to show you some of the areas in the Old Testament where government and authority was despised and it cost them a tremendous thing. Jude, verse 8, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defiled the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Notice it seems like when you find the Word of God that speaks about despising government or despising dominion, one of the things you always find right after it, they speak evil of it. If they think evil, they speak evil, which goes back to Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If he thinks evil and downward, in other words, on a, po on a negative down concerning authority, he's going to wind up speaking evil because a man's confession is a result of his belief. A man's belief is a result of his thinking. A man's thinking is a result of his knowledge, and a man's knowledge is a result of his source. We've already learned there's only two, God and the devil. Your thought process is either, either controlled by God and his word or the devil and his word, and you're going to speak what you believe. Now, this word here, we have another two more words, despise dominion. The word dominion is the same Greek word government, and it simply means a master or a ruler or someone supreme in authority. But this word here, despise, is not the same word despise found in Peter. In Peter's kataproneo means to think downward concerning authorities. But here the word despise means to set aside to neutralize or to violate dignities, authority, or government. So as you think downward toward it, you know what your next move is? You set it aside. In other words, you say, I don't need it in my life. That's wrong. You are involved now in a spirit of rebellion. You are about to be consumed in your own ego and pride. Now, I meet a lot of people both in the church and out of the church and it takes me, and I did not say this by exaggeration, probably at the most time, less than 10 to 15 seconds to realize if they're rebellious or not. You've got to ask one question, hear what they speak, and if they speak against, they've got a problem. And it doesn't take long to find out if the heart or the seed of rebellion is in the heart of the sons of God I expect it to be so in the world because they are of the devil. See, they're unregenerate. They've got to be like their father, the devil. But when you change fathers and meet Jesus, it, it, according to the Word of God, changes your nature, but you better deal with the renewing of your mind and get that trash out of you by the, by the power of the Holy Ghost or you're going to have a problem. See, you're going to speak evil and think negative of authority and dominion. Now, I have, as I said, on numerous occasions, met rebels in the church. I met one of the worst ones I've ever met in my life. I've told you somewhat about him already. 
But I have never met a man that resisted God's authority as I did this man. I met a woman that was rebellious one time that caused more problems against the kingdom of God than I suppose any woman I, I know I've ever met. Rebellious, disobedient. And it gets into a bad situation because you start despising authority, see? You have no respect for God's authority. You have to have. You must have if you can recognize it. Now I want to show you some scriptures here. Look at Isaiah 14. We went through that, but let's go back to it for just a moment. We went through it the other night, but go back to Isaiah 14. Let's look at the first revelation of rebellion against authority. And then we're going to go to the book of Ephesians and 1 John and look, in, look at its reproduction of rebellion and disobedience. Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now Satan's five I wills, I call that. Five times he said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I like if you read in the book of Genesis concerning God's covenant to Abraham, we call it the seven I wills. Satan said five I wills and God came back to Abraham and said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do seven times. I'm going to do this and this and this. It's a blessing. But here he simply said that I'm going to actually rebel is what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak evil of God, despised, I think, very lowly of his authority and his position. I have no respect for his position whatsoever. My, within my thought processes is not the capability to think high or, re, or highly regard or respect or honor the Father or God or his throne at all. So therefore, I think very lowly of him. It doesn't take me long to speak evil of him. And at the same time, I'm very quick to say I'll set him, him aside and I'll take the throne myself. And that's thought processes of rebellion. Now... He didn't make it because the gates of hell won't prevail against the throne because there's called a government system up there that it cannot take it. That's exciting to me. We went through some of that. But I'm going to show you now. Go to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Now he simply said here that there was a time that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. And he then defined the spirit of Satan, the spirit of, of rebellion, the spirit of Antichrist. He said the spirit of Antichrist can be known by, he said, it simply works in the children of disobedience. That spirit of Antichrist works in the heart and in the lives of the children of unbelief is another translation for it. Now, I want to show you something about the word unbelief. We have three set tapes called unbelief, doubt, and progressive unbelief. This one deals with progressive unbelief. The word disobedience, well, the two Greek words for the word belief, unbelief is apostia and apithia. And apithia is the word they entered not because of unbelief, according to Hebrews chapter 4. They could not get into the blessings of God, into the promise of God, into the power of God, into the healing working of Jesus Christ. They couldn't get the promises and the blessings of God because of unbelief. Now this unbelief is a progressive unbelief. It started off, it said they could not enter in in Hebrews 3, 18 and 19. They could not enter in because of unbelief. This is apostia. Apostia is a lack of knowledge. Well, we know how to solve that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They had unbelief because they didn't know. But once they hear it, it's no longer apostia. It's unbelief called apithia. 
Now, you know what I'm saying? It's called the type of unbelief that now I've heard. At first, Father, I didn't know that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was for today. I was in unbelief. I didn't know it. Everybody taught me against it. So I wound without it. But I wasn't trying to rebel against it. I just didn't know. But then comes a teaching, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then comes a teaching, but God, I didn't know that healing was for today. I've always been taught that God doesn't heal anymore, that the days of miracles are over. We're not serving days. Thank God we're serving a God that changeth not. Amen? But I begin to learn that thank God with his stripes I was healed. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. I started learning the word, but at first I didn't know. I wasn't trying to rebel. I wasn't trying to be disobedient. I just didn't know. And as I said, to reinforce that, was the men of God was preaching and teaching me that it's true, that it's not for today. But I did it in ignorance, Paul said. But then come the teaching, the teaching, and the teaching, and the word, the word, the word. Now you've heard it. It's no more apostia, a lack of knowledge. Now it's a decision made against the truth called rebellion. Now it's called disobedience. It's progressive. It'll take you to disobedience. You'll find that word. Same word, disobedience, is translated unbelief in Hebrews chapter 4. You'll also find the word disobedience found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And in those scriptures it talks about, Unto them that believe he's precious, but unto them that be disobedient. Apithia. Same word, those that have unbelief. It's the type of unbelief now that refuses to believe the truth. You've got to rebel to do that. So, question, where is the spirit of Satan, the spirit of error, the spirit of Antichrist working and showing itself? In the children of unbelief that refuse to believe the truth. Those that disobey and rebel. Well, we found out in Samuel that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Unbelief is as the sin of witchcraft. Did you know that? That's what the word says. Rebellion and disobedience. Apithia. Unbelief. Is as the sin of witchcraft. Now. He said. That we're by nature. Look at verse 3. We're by nature the children of wrath. See when you were born. Into the world by the fleshly. Womb of a woman. You were born flesh. You were born with a. Undivine nature. <laughs> you were born with what's called here the. The uh, prince of the power of the air, you were a child of disobedience. Satan was your father. You were by nature disobedient and rebellious. You were by nature the wrath of God. But when you get born again, you're no longer of that nature. Now you're a partaker of a divine nature that loves authority, respects authority, obeys authority, and does not speak evil of authority because you're just like Jesus. At least you ought to be. Now, follow my thinking. Now that I am like Christ and born of his blood, washed of his blood and born of the Spirit of God, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer of the, the work of the devil. I'm no longer a child of disobedience. I'm no longer, in other words, just as easy to say this, King James, because just as easy to say it, it's the same Greek word. I'm no longer a child of unbelief. Thank God I'm a believer. I'm not one that rebels against the truth. When somebody says to me, Randy, the word of God says that the promise of the Holy Ghost is for you, I say, fine, that settles that. Doesn't matter to me what my grandmother said. I want to know what saith the scriptures so I don't rebel against God. I'm, you're not divine authority. My grandmother's not divine authority. My mother's not divine authority. My father's not divine authority. My pastor's not divine authority. I want to know what divine authority says about the divine word, which is final authority. Amen? So I won't rebel against it. So I won't be a child of disobedience or unbelief because I'll tell you why. If you're a child of disobedience, if you're a child of unbelief, you're going to be a child of wrath. Mm. Wonder why you can't get blessed? Why it seems like everything you turn your hand to just falls to pieces? Because you're walking in unbelief or rebellion to authority. You can't have the protection of divine authority unless you submit to authority. <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you a case now. Over in the book of, of, of uh, 1 John, let's look again at this. He called them children of disobedience. This is, now, who's the author of that? 
Satan. In Satan's rebellion against God, he re reproduced children of disobedience and children of wrath, is what he called them in Ephesians 2. They were called children of unbelief and children of the wrath of God. They didn't have the blessing. They had the wrath. They had judgment because of their disobedience. And God will deal with rebellion like he deals with nothing else in the earth. He will deal with disobedience like he deals with nothing else. Look at 1 John chapter 3. Verses 9 through 10. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this the children of God are manifest. Now notice this. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. We're going to have a manifestation in the earth of those that are the children of God and those that are the children of the devil. Let me read on. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Those that walk in rebellion and disobedience can say, Lord, Lord, have I not? And Jesus will say, I don't care what you've said. It's what you've done with what I've said. Have you obeyed me? Has there been obedience in your life? I'm not interested in your sacrifices. I want your obedience. Now, authority deals with you'll know the children of God and the children of the devil by their response to obedience to God and, his re and the respect of up to, uh, to the sons and the daughters of God that are of delegated authority. God is divine authority. We are delegated authority in the earth. Now go, if you will, to the book of Numbers, chapter 16. Number 16. And I want to show you a marvelous revelation in chapter 16 and 17. Dealing with the twelve rods of God in a moment. It was in number 16 that there was a great rebellion. God was faced with a problem. And God had his wisdom and he figured out how to handle the problem from now on. <laughs> and it deals with divine authority. Look at verse 1. Now Korah the son etc. and also Dathan and Abiram. Now those three men. These three men and look at verse 2. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel 250 princesses of the assembly famous in the congregation men of renown. Elders. Three men. 250 elders of the same congregation, men that were famous, men that were known, men that had respect and honor, men that had the fame and the trust of Israel. They rose up against Moses. Verse 3, they gathered themselves together. We're talking about 253 men. And against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spake unto Korah and to all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take your censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, you sons of Levi. And then he's going to speak to his elders. Does it seem a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you, he has sanctified you from the congregation, set you apart from the large congregation, brought him near to himself, made you priest, doing the service of the tabernacle, ministering to the saints, Stand before the congregation to minister, being able to stand and use even the platform and minister to the people. Now notice this next statement. Hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren and sons of Levi with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. What was in their heart that Moses read by the Spirit? Were they satisfied with ministry? 
Were they satisfied with being about the Father's business? Were they satisfied about doing something in the congregation of the people and being able to be separated and sanctified and set apart and having honor and some anointing and revelation? Were they satisfied with that? Were they satisfied with their office and their function in the church? <laughs> what did they want? The priesthood. I want your position. <laughs> I want this position. And I'm not going to quit till I get it. Brothers and sisters, this is the type of the shadow on the earth as it is in heaven. The throne of God is what the devil wanted. He wanted that position. He wasn't satisfied with being the chief cherub. Cherub, cherub. He wasn't satisfied, as the word says, to be beautiful and full of wisdom. He wasn't satisfied with being the bright and morning star, the radiant one of God. Isn't it interesting? One, the one of the most illuminated ones became one of the darkest ones. He wasn't satisfied with experiencing the wisdom, the might, and the glory of God in his life. He wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted the throne. Now I'm going to show you about divine authority that only God has authority. Because when the devil rebelled against God, did he retain his beauty? Did he? Did he retain his glory? Did he retain his light? Did he retain his anointing? No. Why? I thought he had it. Did he have it? Yes, he had it. Where did he get it? From God. And as long as he was in submission to God, it remained. He thought he had it and could operate in it independent of God. But did he keep it? He lost his glory. He lost his wisdom. He became the most ignorant of all angels. The most deceived. The light was put out and darkness became his constant companion. Deception and confusion is the way he thinks. What shut it off? Rebellion. His disobedience. Because he made a mistake, he thought he had it as inherits. But he didn't. If he had it, even in his rebellion, he would have kept it. But he didn't. We have looked at him according to how Ezekiel described him in his glory and his beauty. Brothers and sisters, that was Lucifer before. Jesus said, I beheld him fall from heaven like lightning. Lucifer, after Jesus encountered him on the earth, is no longer like he was before. The one who had was at the, at the, the father's uh, right in there at the right hand of the Father, so to speak. Right there in the very top of the ranks. One of the number three. Lucifer, Michael, Gabriel. We're talking about the top. <laughs> that one who was so majestic at one time. Had everything he always needed. Had everything he ever needed. But you know what happened to him? Jesus watched him fall because of rebellion. And when Jesus was through with him, having spoiled principalities and powers, exousias, all types of authority that was rebellious against God, having spoiled principalities, chief, archais, numero uno, and powers, exousias, all types of authorities, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. In other words, he made a public exhibit of Satan's rebelliousness and made a public exhibit of Satan's defeat and he's no longer got what he had. He's no longer beautiful. He's the curse personified. The Word of God tells me that he'll lay all these things that came upon us upon our enemies. He is the cancer personified. He is the migraine personified. He is death personified. He is fusion, confusion personified. He is depression personified. He is stupidity personified. Rebellion lost him the greatest position, one of the greatest positions that anybody should have been satisfied with. But no, I want that pastoral office. I'm going for the priesthood. Going for the old numero uno, the Father's throne, the shepherd of everybody, the shepherd, the only, the true shepherd, the one true shepherd of all the universe, Father. Seek ye the priesthood also? <laughs> Verse 11, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against me? For what cause? 
Let's forget all the other things you've murmured and called and said about me. I want to talk about you. This is the root of the problem. You have rebellion in your heart. You want the priesthood. Let's just go ahead and be honest with each other, he said. For which cause? And Moses sent to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small... Now listen to their accusation. You know, are they quick to speak against dignities if they're in rebellion? The word says they don't mind opening their mouth and speaking quickly against authority. It, is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey? Do you hear that? You brought us out of a land that was flowing with milk and honey. You brought us out of Egypt. Or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. It was your fault, Moses, that we ever got out of Egypt anyway. Boy, I tell you what, I wouldn't mind being accused of that. Yes, sirree, hallelujah, I was the one responsible for delivering you from the power of the stinking devil. <laughs> You're right, I brought you up, but I have to remind you and jar your thinking, it was not a land that flowed with milk and honey, run out these men's lives. They were the one that murmured to God day and night for deliverance. <laughs> They were in bondage. They were in servitude. They were oppressed. They were treated like dogs. But now they're out of that. They have an opportunity for the priesthood. And they're going to accuse him falsely, first of all, evil accusations, the work of the flesh, demonically inspired, and speak evil against Moses. Now let's read on. And Moses was very hot. <laughs> and said unto the Lord, Respect not their offering. <laughs> I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Now, I want you to listen to Moses' authority. Moses finally started speaking about authority called covering, protection. I don't want you, God, to respect anything they've got. Boy, that's lifting authority right there over the camp. Moses said in the Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron, tomorrow. And take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer. Two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. Verse 18. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them. Notice they didn't gather with them, against them. Unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and, and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation. I'm going to consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall notice this statement. One man sinned. Did one man sin? I thought 253 of them sinned. They were influenced, 252 of them. One man named Korah had the idea, I want the throne. One angel, Satan, had the idea that he wanted the throne. And because of his rebellion, how many of the angels of God did he take with him? A third. One angel's rebellion. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, let's read on. Turn the page with me. If you've got a Bible like mine. <laughs> verse 29. Actually in verse 28 and stuff, Moses again said, I haven't done a thing to him. Verse 29. If these men die the common death of all men, in other words, just die normal death of old age, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, in other words, again, just a natural common death, then the Lord hath not sent me. Whoa. I'll ask you a question. Who was delegated authority? Was it Moses or Korah? Moses. God gave authority to Moses, God's authority, and Moses was the man that had the authority to do with it as he desired according to the judgment of rebellion or disobedience or obedience. And Moses is about to use some authority called lifting the old...
uh, perverted relationship with his stepmother and you have not rather repented over it, you've gloried over it, you turn him loose to the devil. You release him to the work of Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved. Are you familiar with the account? Do you know what happened to the man? Destruction came on him immediately and it repented him and he turned back to God. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians, don't condemn the man, forgive him and receive him, lest he come under the condemnation of the devil. But you see, he didn't say that latter. He said, first, you get rid of that. You have protected him in the church. You've covered him. You've hid his sins. And he said, that is wrong. You lift that authority, release him to go his own ways, and let the devil have him. If he should repent, because his flesh gets destroyed, that's usually when you turn to God, you know, when you're in the hospitals. It's amazing to me how quick they talk about us people of power and the Holy Ghost, but it's so many of them that I used to visit in the hospitals that didn't like me. When it touches your flesh, your health, or your money, people call on God like there's no doctrine. <laughs> Well, you know it, don't you, brother? You've been there, too. I mean, you're tired of doctrine. Is there anybody that's got some power? <laughs> I need help, not just some doctrine. I'm tired of eschatology. Who cares about the end time? What about now? <laughs> well, Moses began to lift an authority here. But, verse 30, if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, in other words, their sons, their daughters, their wife, their kids, their everything, and they go down quick into the pit alive, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Who was they really provoking? See, they had no understanding of divine authority. Moses didn't stand in that position with inherent ability. He stood in that position with delegated ability. It was the Holy Ghost empowering him and enabling him to work the signs and the wonders that delivered the very men that rejected Moses. They forgot and they couldn't marish Moses. In other words, they couldn't make a distinction anymore how much man was involved and how much God was. They just thought they were just born with this stuff. Satan made that mistake. Now, verse 31, it came to pass. It usually does when the covenant is lifted. <laughs> As he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder split that was under them. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. That was exactly what Moses said. If I am an authority of God, if I am a minister and a priest of the Most High God, if I am a prophet of God, then let God show it to be true that I am not retaining my own authority. I'm only representing God's authority in the earth. And if I'm accurately representing God's authority, then let them not die the natural death. Don't let them go the natural way of all the earth. Let them die this way. The earth will open up and all them and all that they have will go into the pit alive. And that is exactly what happened. Because it wasn't Moses that they were really against, according to God's interpretation. It was the Lord. Let me read on. And all Israel, that verse 34, that were round about them, fled at the cry of them. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. 250 of the elders, men of renown, men of leadership capacity, men that were leading. But it consumed them and all that they had. And it said that fear hit all the congregation of Israel and they ran in fear of God. So you'll find from verses 1 to 40, you'll find the re elders rebellion. Now let's look at verse 41 on. But on the morrow, Less than 24 hours. All the, con all, <laughs> hello, all the congregate. 
A little leaven leaveth the whole stinking lump. <laughs> Out of one man's sin, he corrupted and devoured 250 elders and the whole congregation. I don't mind telling you, I've met what we call in number 16, the Korah Company. I've watched these other men, quote, of God in the congregation, quote, that want the priesthood, quote, that always take a third with them when they split. You tell me the nature of it. I've watched churches split because of rebellious of one man that wanted the priesthood and because he couldn't get the control, because he couldn't get the authority position, because he didn't have the dominating control, he finally just started his own. And I don't mind telling you boldly that stuff is of the devil. I would walk in the door of any church that's born out of strife and rebellion because the blessing of God is not on it. It doesn't matter how it appears to be for the time. They are children of disobedience and children of wrath. Period. <laughs> Truth personified. Period. But you say, well, I'll tell you what. I've seen churches do that. That was of God. Shame on you. You're just naive to a subtle tongue. Jesus said when he come and divide, you know what he said he'd divide? The light from the darkness, not the light from the light. It's rebellion that comes into the house of God and the seed of a man's own ego that the devil uses to do the same thing he did in Isaiah 14, to do the same thing that was done in Numbers 16. Bring one man's desire for the macho leadership. He doesn't know a thing about leadership. Does Jesus make leaders? What does he make? Servants. Thank God you've learned the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Not as the Gentiles, brothers and sisters, these type of people are as the Gentiles. They got one thing in mind. I want the controls. Give me the helmets. I mean, give me the captain's helm. Give me the controls right now. I want this church. I'm going to take it. And if you don't submit to me, I'll just start my own. Watch the pattern of it. It's just a matter of time until it splits again. Because everything reproduces after its own kind. Working within that church is another leader ready for the leadership. One more sitting there saying, one of these days, brother, I'm going to bust upon you because you're not doing the job near like I could do because I know what I'd do if I was the pastor. I'd change a lot of things. You sure would. Believe me, you make a lot of changes. And they're all for the devil. Well, go ahead and read on, Randy. You don't have to be intimidated. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Listen to that. <laughs> I mean, that is the epitome of deception, isn't it? Moses, <laughs> you killed 250 of them. Moses, you didn't know I had that type of power, did you? Watch me just split that earth right now. Inherit a power. They had a problem called deception, didn't they? One man. One man. Is it powerful? Is rebellion effective? It's powerful, isn't it? It can take a third of the angels of God. It can take a third of the church. And it usually does. Powerful. But let me echo Jesus for just a moment. Take it back to the most power there ever was. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of rebellion shall not prevail against it. That's just one more that will not prevail against this body. <laughs> Do you know why? Because we're recognizing divine authority. We're learning to recognize God and His authority, whomever He may minister it through. <laughs> Let me read on. It came to pass, verse 42, when the congregation was gathered against Moses. Ah, here we go again, gathered against them. And we're talking about planning this thing. This didn't happen overnight. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight for 253 men 
their wives, their kids, and all the congregation to wind up in rebellion. Brothers and sisters, something's going on under the dark for a long period of time. And God just said, I'll just wait. And the moment it breaks out, I'm going to stand my divine authority, or excuse me, my delegated authority before me, and I'm going to place my words in his mouth, and he's going to say, Father, do not honor them. Lift your authority and protection over their life. And behold, the cloud covered it, the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 44, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Hold the thoughts. The first time God says he's going to consume them, what did Moses do? He prayed. God says, uh-uh. So he came back after prayer and declared the means of their own destruction. This time when God says, I'm going to consume him, did he fall on his face and pray? Did he intercede for him? No. Why? Because the Holy Ghost already told him, I'm lifting the covering. You'll pray for them no more. I don't want Aaron praying. I don't want you praying. This is it. But God still honored one last attempt of Moses to bring covering or protection. Let's read it. Moses, verse 46, said unto Aaron, Take a censer, put fire therein from all the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. The only thing we got left is the blood. Every other authority has been stripped except the blood, and I'm just going to trust that when God sees the blood, he'll pass over Oh, blessed be the name of God. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, and the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, thank God for representation. Aren't you thankful that Aaron didn't sit there and debate it with us? And now look, Moses, I happen to know a better way. I've been in this thing before. And this is the 15th time I've done this since we came out of Egypt. Thank God for no substitution but for representation. Aaron got on the stick. <laughs> And took as Moses commanded and ran. Didn't sit there and debate for 45 minutes. Ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood. I want you to notice the great high priest. The intercessor. Where did he stand? Between the dead. <laughs> oh and the living. <laughs> Who's the type of the shadow of that? Jesus, in the book of Genesis 15, it says, And God cut a covenant, and he sliced it and set it down the middle, split it right down the center, a marismos. And he said, And the light and the lamp and the glory passed between the pieces. Do you know what that light and glory was? The glory of redemption and the light of Jesus. Do you know what it was doing with the twain, the two pieces? Making the two pieces one. Thank God for Jesus. When there was a great division between the Father and myself, between God and you, and there was a, the, 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 those that was one had become twain. You and the Father were separated by God because of your sins. But because of the great high priest, he stood between the living God and the dead, which was us, dead in our sins and our trespasses. And he made an atonement for you and me. And what did it say about the curse? And the plague was stayed. Who hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Removing the curse, proclaiming the blessing, when we were all in rebellion and disobedience. He went in between us, and the two pieces that were cut asunder were sewed up by the blood and made one. Mm, thank you, Jesus. But there were consequences. Verse 49, Now they that died in the plague were 14,700, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. 
And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. 14,700, 353, excuse me, 253. 14,700 plus 253, 14,953 plus their children, their wives, their sheep, their cattle, their home, all that pertaineth unto them went down either by the plague or by the pit. Do you know what caused it? The sin of rebellion from one man's lips that didn't mind speaking evil of God's authority. I'm going to tell you where the blessing is. And I'm going to tell you where the curse is. The blessing remains on the obedience. But the, clay, the plague is already started on the disobedience. Where there is rebellion and disobedience, you will find the plague and the power of the pit. Well, thank you, Jesus. My father had a problem, didn't he? He was facing an issue now. I've got rebellion broke out all over the congregation. I've lost 250 of my best elders that I have trained and discipled for a long time. About the only thing we've got left, Moses, is you and Aaron and Miriam, and they've murmured against me anyway. Mary, Miriam and Aaron did against Moses. And she became leprous. He's got to come up with something now. There must be established now a means... To where divine authority can be respected and known on the earth. And here's what he did, chapter 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, and of all their princes according to the house of their fathers twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they, are, they murmured against me. Now before I read on, listen to me. He said, I want you now to take 12 rods, one rod from each tribe. And I'm going to choose a rod that's going to represent my authority in the earth. Called divine authority, the divine authority of the 12 rods. But we've got to find which one has divine authority. Well, wait a minute. What about the other 11 tribes? Aren't they also the sons of God? Yeah. Don't they also have the right to the inheritance? Yes. Don't they also have the blessings of God through the covenant? Yes. Well, I mean, I can prophesy too, brother. I don't have to listen to you. I mean, I can minister too. I, I'm also a, well, you know, I happen to be a royal priesthood now, according to Peter. Yes, I know that. I know that. You arrogant charismatics. <laughs> I know that. You can prophesy and lay hands on the sick and cast out devils with the rest of us now. I used to be Pentecostal. I used to be charismatic. Thank God for the truth. Made me a believer. And what took place? They began to say, I can do that too. I mean, you're no different than I am. I got the same Jesus. I got the same blood of Christ. I got the same Holy Ghost. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me also. And greater is he that's also in me than he that's in the world. Just like he that's in you. I see no distinction between us. You've got a problem. Let's see, with our daddy make a distinction. He didn't have a problem with it. Verse 6, And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princesses gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among the rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Where did he put them? In the tabernacle of witness, where it can be witnessed. <laughs> And it came to pass that on the morrow me, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi 
which rod? The rod of Aaron for which tribe? Levi. Please keep that in mind. And it took, and it came to pass that, bro, mo, that it says, it, let me go back. It came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Le Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed bo blossoms, and yielded almonds. Which one of the twelve did God say is going to blossom and come forth and be in a position of authority? The Levi, Aaron. Now, follow along. And Moses brought out of all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. I guess they did look. What a disappointment. I thought I was important too. Well, you are. But in your place. And the Lord said unto Moses, bring Aaron's rod. Oh, I like my daddy when he speaks. Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. Now I'm going to show you how to remove the rebels' hearts, remove their murmuring, and remove the death that will come upon them because of rebellion. What did he say was going to be the representation of God's divine authority in the earth? The rod of Aaron. Out of all the twelve tribes, only one rod did God bless, him, bl uh, woo, bless and say would prosper. Aaron's. It was called the rod of an almond tree. You've heard me make that statement. The rod of an almond. It brought forth almonds. <laughs> there was an authority. There was an authority established in the earth after that time called the rod of Aaron and what was it for? A witness against whom? The rebels. Now, old thinking, go with me for a moment. When you go into the holies of holies and you go to the Ark of the Covenant, you find three items in that Ark. What are they? The rod of Aaron, the manna, the Ten Commandments. In the Ark of the Covenant, hallelujah, by which I hold now in my hand, the Ark of God's Covenant, where you open it up and out of it flows God's authority, out of it flows the manna, Christ, the Logos, the Rhema, and out of it flows, what else? The word of God of teaching us the respect of God. The ways of God, if you would. The do's and the don'ts of a spirit-filled life. So when I open up the covenant of God, we have for the last probably 15 or 20 years enjoyed the manna and the commandments. Learning to ex enjoy the Word of God. But there's one thing we haven't really looked into much in that Ark of the Covenant. It's called the divine rod of authority that will be set there forever as a token against rebellion and disobedience. And God tells us, according to His Word, that He will follow me. I'll just take you with me. In the book of Proverbs, go with me for a moment in that book. Verse, uh, chapter 22. Thank you. Go with me for a moment to Proverbs 13, 24. And then we'll take you to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, can you help me rightly interpret the word of God? What is the rod of God? 
his authority. Now what does it say about using? He that spares the authority on a child. Now I realize that also in the natural there's the physical rod. But the first thing the child learns, should learn, is not the physical rod. It is the spiritual rod. He must first learn authority. And you cannot spare teaching him authority. Or it will make a rebel out of him. Because I've heard people say, hey, I didn't spare the rod to my child. He's still rebellious. You probably beat him to his black and blue and beat nothing into him, but, into him but rebellion. You're rough with your kids. You're crude. You're violent. You're angry. You're hostile. You don't throw, show them authority. You show them your own rebellion and you beat it into them. No wonder your kids turn out the way they do. I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. There's not one child on the earth that didn't come out somewhere because of their, pro their parents' problem. Because I'm confident of the Word of God, and the Word makes it very clear that every seed reproduces after its own kind. Rebellion is taught. And somebody didn't show authority. Somebody showed rejection. Somebody showed hostility. Somebody showed anger. And the child grew up being rejected, and being rejected causes rebellion. That's one of the ways it's caused. I know that Satan was not rejected himself only after rebellion came, but his pride defeated him. Now, go to, to uh, Proverbs 22. Verse 15, it says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. What is the rod? God's authority. Foolishness, rebellion, disobedience, I've seen kids just go on and on and on. Mama tells them, now, if you don't shut up, I'm going to whip you. If you don't shut up, I'm going to whip you. You're a liar and you're lying to the kid. He's learned what it means to, to know that your word means nothing. He has no respect for you. You know what his problem is? He doesn't respect authority because authority is not represented. I've seen them over in the, in the malls and in, in, in the places where I've been, church, I tell you what, give me the child for a week and I'll teach him authority. Where your whippings will have to be longer in between because all he needs is the understanding of authority. Foolishness is bound in the child that doesn't understand authority because the rod of God is not being used. You cannot use the rod of beating and expect that only to work. You must bring to him the understanding of authority. Bring him up in understanding authority that, excuse me, young man, you have just met authority. You don't and are not going to get the pastoral role of my office as the priest of my own house. I'm going to show you that I'm representing God. And this happens to be a pastoral role. And you're not going to be learning to do that. Because it's those kids that learn to do that against their parents. That don't mind speaking evil against the men of God. And causing division to get the pulpit. The rod. Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. 23, 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You can't give him too much of the revelation of authority. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, Aaron's rod. Let's use his. Amen. That will work. And shalt deliver his soul from hell, meaning rebellion and disobedience. You'll drive rebellion and disobedience out of him. You'll drive wickedness out of him. You'll drive... I've seen the kids rebel against their mamas and daddies. And all the time they're whipping them, they're saying in their heart, when I get old enough, I'm leaving, man. That's not correcting the child. He's still rebellious. He's learned one thing, the hostility and the anger of the parent, but he still hasn't met authority. Doesn't know what authority is. Because see, to us, authority means some type of dictatorship, some type of Hitlership. That's not the way God is. Not as the Gentiles, <laughs> but even as the Son of Man. His type of authority. Go to one more, 29, Proverbs 29, 15. <clears throat> the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. What brings wisdom? 
the rod and reproof. Now the word wisdom simply means the right or the ability to ascertain right and wrong and to live comfortably and workably in society. I was dealing with the pastor and his wife a long time ago and I had to be honest with him and I just finally told him you're not going to go any farther and you work with God until you deal with the, your own household. Your house is out of order, your kid rules. And I finally had to be honest with him because the child, I mean, I have never seen a child that could have so much control and authority in my life as this little guy. How old was he? Two years old. And I am not exaggerating. Every time I went to the man of God's house, the fellowship or spend time with him, he had to leave because of his kid. The kid dominated the whole thing. And he would spend an hour or an hour and a half in a, in a dark room rocking his child because his kid wouldn't go to sleep unless he gave it to him. And I'm sitting in there wasting an hour and a half of my precious time in Jesus. And brothers and sisters, without arrogance, I was much too important for that. I mean, I'm handling destiny. I'm involved in the kingdom of God. I don't have time to sit there while a man maybe sits a two-year-old kid in the dark and rocks him. It's nothing personal. I'm not talking about an ego problem. I'm talking about I understand what I've got to do. Thank God when Lazarus was ready to come forth, Jesus said, I'd like to come and raise him up, but I mean, I got this kid I got to babysit. That kid would take care of himself. He'd teach a little authority to him. Well, I talked to the man, and I said, I got to be honest with you, Pastor. I said, I'd be doing you and your son a great injustice if I don't tell you the truth. I said, that there was an offense incurred to me today. I just got through ministering his church. I said, I walked out and I got in my van. And his other little boy, precious little guy, I don't know where he got it, <laughs> but a precious little guy. Well, they handle him differently. I'll take that back. And this, this couple of pastors, well, I'll tell you what, I love them so much, and I mean that from my heart. I have no problem with them, but I have to face the truth. With the Word of God, the rod was not being applied. It was being hidden away. And when the, and he came out to me, the pastor, when his other little boy got on, and, he, and his, his other little boy said, Daddy, I want to go with Randy in the vans, all right? So his daddy came up with his other little boy in his hand, which is always in his arms, complete dominance. Would not let his daddy get anywhere. If his daddy walked out of the house to went to the church, the baby would start screaming and crying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And it would go on for half an hour. Well, he had a little boy in his arms and said, Hey, Randy, will you take so-and-so also? And I lied like the devil. I said, yeah, I'll be glad to. <laughs> and I want you to know that lie bothered me. I said, Randy, you're not being honest. You lied, didn't you? I, said, I sure did. I lied like the devil. I don't want the kid around me at all. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to repent or you're going to hide the lie? I'm going to repent. I went to him and I said, Pastor, I got to confess something to you. This is how I got started on the conversation. I lied to you all ago. You asked me would I take your kid. And I said, the fact of the matter is I don't want to be anywhere around him. I said, I don't like that little boy. I said, he's got the spirit of rebellion and disobedience in him, and it's your fault. Because you haven't given him the rod. You haven't shown him authority. You have shown him nothing. So I said, let's you and I have a talk today before we go on any farther. So I sat him down and I told him, according to the word of God, if you can't rule your own house, you can't rule the house of God. Let's talk about obedience. So we sat down with him and his wife. And I'll tell you what, it's tough to tell a woman her kids are rebellious. But this couple sat and looked at me, and by the time the Holy Ghost was through with them on the, in the Word of God, they looked at me and said, she's crying, he's crying, said, I can't help but say it's the truth. And it came out of that one scripture right here that I read in Proverbs right then. The scripture that says, if you give him the rod of God, you'll teach him what? Wisdom. And I told him, I'm going to show you why I must talk to you about this boy. Because you won't teach him the wisdom, which means the ability to ascertain or to perceive right and wrong and live in a society with the ethics of right and wrong. You're not teaching him the right and wrong because he doesn't know what's right and wrong. You've never told him no. Did you know that if you don't, if you don't correct and reprove a child, that you are not teaching him right and wrong? He doesn't know how far he can go. He's never been told that you shouldn't do that. He, he's never been told he shouldn't scream while the guy, the guy, the pastor's trying to preach. So he'll he'll scream all the way through the message. But it doesn't take long for him to get the message he shouldn't do that if he listens to the right message. <laughs> Amen. They'll shut up quick, and that foolishness come out of him rapidly. <laughs>
So I told him, I said, but you know what you've done an injustice for? Because you haven't shown him the ark of authority and opened it up to him and showed him the authority of God. You've taught him rebellion and disobedience and disrespect. And you, now you're leaving him to me. I classify it as society. And I want you to know something, my pastor friend, that society will not mind rejecting him. And that's the wrong way to teach him right and wrong. The only reason I don't want him around, he's wrong. But I'm representing now to him a society, and society doesn't want those type of troubled kids. So what do they do? They reject him. The kid's not wise enough to know that in the rejection is nothing personal, but you're rebellious. They don't figure that out. They take a self-image complex. Nobody likes me. Well, what's wrong with me? Mom and dad didn't tell you what was wrong with you. You never learned it, you rebellious thing. But if they told you, son, that's rebellion, that's disobedience, I told you once, in the mouth of two or three, it's going to be established. I'm not going to go down the ten, ten time bit <laughs> and then still do nothing. I'm going to teach you authority by the rod of God. And when you hit society, they won't reject you. Then you won't have an image problem. Now, you're no different, brothers and sisters. In the eyes of God, God has against his big kids a great beautiful rod called divine authority. And Jeremiah, look at 112. I'll show you now where we get the rod of an almond. Doesn't this just kind of put a, a damper in you that you just don't want to just get up and speak evil every time somebody preaches on something? I don't mind telling you, you better not touch the anointed. <laughs> the word of God says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. You ought to believe that. You like to stand on the word of God and confess it? So do I. So stand and say, Father in the name, don't do it now, but do it. Yeah, Father in the name of Jesus, I'm obedient to the word of God. I'm a word man. I believe your word above everything else. And word of God is final authority. Therefore, your word says, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Therefore, in Jesus Christ's name, I confess right now that Randy Shankle does not touch God's anointed and he does not speak evil of your prophets. Chapter 1, verse 11 of Jeremiah. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see the rod of an almond tree. Thou, listen to this, verse 2, Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen. Now, don't you like this scripture? For I will hasten my word to perform it. How many has ever stood on that word of God and confessed that one? Boy, I've used that. Come on, lift your hand. How many has stood on that word and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to believe you right now to hasten your word to perform it on my behalf. Lift your hand up. Did you know what in context it was? You didn't, did you? <laughs> you just found the power of Scripture and jumped it. Listen to it in this context. Jeremiah, what is this that you see? He says, Lord, I see the rod of an almond tree. And he said, you've seen well. And because, listen to this, because what you see is the truth, which is you are now looking at divine authority represented in the earth. Because you see my authority and recognize it, then I'm going to hasten my word to perform it. That's why I'm going to be quick to watch over it, to execute it. Now, that gives me a joy. Because I know something, as long as I'm walking in delegated authority to God, which is divine authority, that I know something. That when I open my mouth like Moses and speak the word of God, because of sub submitting to divine authority, I know that my father will hasten his word to execute it on my behalf. Now I'm going to give you a scripture that the Holy Ghost has given me very much and tremendous boldness in doing it. I've done it quite often. Turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 140, I mean, one, uh, yeah, 149, Divine authority is exciting, isn't it? Unless you're a rebel. Verse 5 of Psalms 149. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon the beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Hold it. Don't read on any farther. Please respect it for just a moment and listen to me. Look at me. It says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. What is the purpose of the authority of God's word in your mouth and in your hand? Now let's read that. 
to to that means for this purpose to execute vengeance upon the heathen punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them your own judgments no the judgment that's already written this honor have all his saints <laughs> this honor have all his saints praise ye the lord do you mean to tell me father you've given me delegated authority yes i have son luke 10 19 and what am i supposed to do with this authority represent me in the earth and then this is what you can do. You can execute vengeance upon the heathen. Punishments upon the people. This, I want you to know, this honor I have, I didn't say I had it. The word says this is what I have as an honor. This is my privilege. I've got to be wise, but to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters, and I am able to pronounce upon them the judgment that is already written that says God will not be mocked whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. Turn them over to the devil for the corruption of their flesh. They've sowed it for years. Violence, wickedness, vile, uncleanness. It'll come back to them. God's not going to be mocked. But people are afraid to turn the wicked over. They're afraid to do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't know if they ought to do it. I'm not afraid of it. I know the word of God on it. And I want you to know something. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the house cleaning business. Hallelujah. Rebellion is an enemy of God. Disobedience is an enemy of God. Wickedness is an enemy of God. And anything that opposes my father's divine nature and causes trouble and havoc to the church of the living God and gets in the way of the move of the Holy Ghost, I don't mind confronting in the name of Jesus and say, brothers and sisters, whomever you are, you are now about to see divine authority because I'm going to bring you the rod of God. And we'll see what happens when the rod of God is brought before the rebels as a token against them. Is it my authority? Is it my power? Is it my own anger? No. It's God's rod to be a token against rebellion. Rebellion's not driven out by compromising and patting with it. It's driven out by a man that knows how to release the judgment upon them that is already written. Hmm. See, but that's tough. I know that. But I want you to know something. Tough or not tough, I didn't write this stuff. It's exciting to me. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Sapphire and Ananias thought they could get by with it. And if they had it, everybody else would have. We're talking about New T now. New Testament. We're talking about people that lied to the Holy Ghost. And there was no need for it. Peter said, hey, we didn't ask you for anything. Did not everything you have was yours, own, yours already to do with it as you desired? That wasn't the problem. You lied not to me, he said, but to the Holy Ghost. Zap. Their own judgment came upon them. As I've heard in the David Insel translation, you lie, you fry. And they did. So do you see what we're saying? Am I talking new tea? Am I talking about something that's passed away? No, I'm not. Because I want you to know something. The Ark of the Covenant is still with us. And I'll tell you where it's at. It's nigh me even in my heart and in my mouth. The word of faith. The word of God. The Ark of the Covenant hid within the holies of holies. And oh, I'm learning. You're learning how to release it. How to open up that veil and let the Holy One out. And let him rule in the earth as he desires. Come on out, O Holy Ghost, as the authority of God. Bring the rod of God and execute judgment upon the body of Christ because the Word says judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. What type of judgment? Wait a minute, you're prophesying judgment on the house of God. Yes, I am. On the rebellious. Because Jeremiah says, Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah said, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Not to those that are going to be obedient. <laughs> You're not have, going to have any problem if you're obedient. You won't even know the judgment come. You'll be sitting underneath the sunshine of Jesus, just speaking in tongues, having a ball, blessing his name, and everybody else having trouble. It doesn't come on the house of disobedience. It comes on the house of God, those that are in it, that need to be out of it or repent. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, 
You shall be devoured by the mouth of the Lord, by the sword of the 